Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Great. So I'm John Wainwright, and today I'll be sharing uh, my per perspective on life on a, in the epidemic. Uh, some of you might know me better as Amanda's husband or Lauren Wainwright's father, as you know, they are the bright spots in tapestry. I'll get on to a little bit more about them later in my discussion, but I wanted to share kind of what my life view is and where I feel I fit in. Uh, I've had many great mentors through through my lifetime, and I'm sure many more to, to come. One of them suggested I put together a, a life purpose wheel and really building what around a central focus and what are all those other parts of it. Uh, in giving this talk today, I thought that wheel really represented the balance that I strive for, uh, but still have a long way to go. So, you know, I've been an engineer for almost uh, over 20 years now, actually. And uh, as I, I had the fortunate uh, luck to end up in medical device, really, and it was by a series of uh, coincidences that I ended up in this space and where I am today. And, you know, it really does give me this ability to potentially save millions of lives. So I developed devices to treat stroke. Uh, stroke is the number two cause of death worldwide and the number one cause of disability. And only about 10 to 15% of stroke patients are treated worldwide. So it's a huge population that can be benefited. Uh, the second part of this is in a beneficial environment. And that's really where I've been concentrating more of my time. That I want to not only you know, be able to save millions of lives, but I want to do this in a beneficial environment, not only at work and at home. And this is where the balance really comes from. So with my, my work, I talked a little bit about the devices that I developed and, and that work you know, creating better relationships, career growth opportunities. And this is where I, I spend a lot of my day. Actually, right here, standing in this spot is where I spend most of my day. I'm generally on WebExes or Zooms from 7 a.m. till 6 p.m. Somehow I've eliminated an hour and a half out of my commute every day and worked more hours than I ever have before. Uh, also, the you know, there's no longer that separation. Well, I have my phone on me all the time, so there's never separation. But you know, there's even less separation when my home office is uh, is where I work. In terms of you know developing devices for stroke, there's a couple of things to to remember. As I mentioned, stroke is the number one cause of, of death, or number two cause of death worldwide. And last month was. Uh, was stroke month and really recognizing those signs of stroke is vitally important. So face drooping, arm weakness, and speech difficulty. And then it's time to get to the hospital. And it's really time to get to the right hospital. That only about 10% of hospitals actually have a uh, comprehensive stroke center. The three listed down here below, Mission Hospital, UCI Medical Center in Orange, and St. Joseph in Orange are the three around us. Uh, generally, I think most of us live close to Mission Hospital. So it's very important not only to get to a hospital, but to the right one, because you could lose about 1.9 million neurons per minute. So time really is brain. This is even more important in this time of COVID because there are cardiovascular complications that come with this, as well as people don't wanna to go to the hospital because of you know, the potential for infection. Uh, the images here on the right show, uh, this was a 17 year old boy in Florida that had an MCA occlusion. And the device shown here with the clot on it is actually one of the ones that I've worked on in the past few years. And so the, the boy was able to regain use of his arms and leg um, and hopefully will lead to a good recovery. So, you know, this just illustrates the, the need to be able to get to the hospital and have the correct treatment. Moving on to the other portions of this wheel, I have my, my community, right? My friends, the UU Church 
and UCI. Uh, I, I now, well, I used to work right on the UCI campus, which gave me a great opportunity to interact with, with students. Uh, I have a, a goal of retiring into uh, teaching, and so, you know, this helps me on my, my life journey. The other portion of that is around my health. Uh, fitness, I, I often go mountain biking. Uh, Strava tells me I spend three hours a week mountain biking and do about 20 miles. So this is not only good for my physical health, but my mental health, as I find this is a great way for uh, my meditation. The way up the hill, I can kind of clear my mind and the way down the hill, the only thing I'm thinking about is, you know, getting down the hill as fast as I can. Uh, yesterday, I was, I was uh, biking and it was kind of funny. I passed somebody on the way up the hill and as they stopped, they kind of toppled over into a bush and they laughed because it was just funny to them. And I thought, well, that's a great attitude. You know, they weren't taking themselves so seriously. Well, the way down the hill, my chain fell off and I looked down and bent over and then I fell off the trail. And so I couldn't help to laugh and then pull all the stickers out of my butt. So while it was a little painful, I still maintained a good attitude and it was a great opportunity. So that really brings me into this mindfulness and gratitude and learning, which I'll talk about a little bit more. So when I, I think about this wheel, the best way I can help all of these portions of the wheel is through this mindfulness and gratitude. Uh, a very brilliant woman that I know turned me on to this 10% Happier uh, podcast. So I started listening to this to work and it was much better for my daily commute than anything else I had done. But this turned me on to loving kindness meditation. Uh, and so the practice of loving kindness meditation is you say, may I be safe, may I be happy, may I be healthy, and may I live with ease. You repeat these with you and we as a world. And this is, you know, even more today. This is all of us together. And then the gratitude person. Uh, Ming Yur Rinpoche was on uh, the podcast the other day that I was listening to. And he was talking about this 10 finger principle that we have 10 fingers, but if something is wrong with one of them, that's what we concentrate on. So, how do we? make sure we're concentrating on those other nine things. Dave talked about how, you know, I have the privilege to be in a, a safe place, in a safe house. I have everything I need here. And it, it really is, you know, great that I can spend time with my family, uh, even through this turmoil. And the last portion of this is my family. So this was our, our uh, winter picture and, and postcard that we use. Who knew, you know, wishing you a peaceful year full of love would be even more important as we go through this pandemic. And we went to you know, Hawaii for my wife's 40th birthday. But now this is where we spend a lot of our, our time. My wife's arm is there, but she didn't like that picture. So, so she thought I should share this one instead. Uh, my hair definitely has grown a little bit, which she is none too sad about. Quickly, I'll move into how I look at the pandemic. You know, wearing masks is very helpful. And this is really about risk management and mitigations. What's the likelihood and the impact? And breaking this down into simpler terms, if nobody's wearing a mask, everybody gets pissed on. If one person wears it, you're less likely to get it keyed on. And if everybody wears a mask, then everybody keeps their germs to themselves. And you know, life is much better. I also look at this in terms of my biking and how this now affects my biking is I end up wearing a mask. And the silver lining of this is I'm sure my lungs are getting better because damn, it's hard to breathe getting up that hill. So I'll leave you with, may we all find a little bit more balance in the circle game. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Tamara and I wanna thank the worship committee for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about 
what being thrown in the realm of social distancing has meant to me. First, to provide a little context as to where I was mentally back then. We had just returned home from a five-week cruise, the literal epitome of a situation that did not involve social distancing. However, within 10 days of our return home on March 7th, Orange County enacted shelter-in-place provisions. The date to be exact was March 17th, and it's emblazoned in my mind. It's emblazoned because it really did prove to be that traumatic to this incurable extrovert. Extrovert meaning that I derive my energy from being around other people. So those first few weeks of social distancing were pretty rough. In reading back through the journal I kept during that time, it's very clear that I essentially traveled through the five stages of grief as I worked to adjust, meaning denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. So here's how each of those stages went. Stage one, denial. Otherwise known as, I can't believe this is happening. As I read through first our county, then our subsequent state mandates of what was no longer allowed. So no more concerts, plays, dinner dates, family get togethers, outdoor physical activity get togethers. How would I function? Stage two, anger. My thoughts ran the gamut. Why didn't we come to this better prepared as a nation? Why didn't we shut down international travel sooner, interstate travel? Heck, even interstate travel. Whose fault is this? Let's find out so we can tell them how mad we are. And of course, with no real ability to do that, I did the next best thing and I became mad at my spouse instead. I mean, honestly, if I apologized once to him for my anger and grouchiness, I apologized a dozen times. At one point, I think I just turned to him and said, how about if I just apologize now for all the times in the future, I'm probably going to do something necessitating an apology. Thank goodness I married a very forgiving man. Stage three, bargaining. This is when I kept looking for ways to push the envelope just a bit. How about if we go walking at the beach, but we wear our masks? Let's go to the supermarket, but wear our masks. How about if we pick up takeout, but we'll eat it somewhere else? How about if we invite friends to a park, but we all sit six feet apart? I found ways to make all those work in order to have fleeting interactions with other people because staying safely at home was really simply not an option for me. I literally needed the energy of other people in order to feel alive. Stage four, depression. I truly suffered deeply as a result of having to drastically curtail my interactions with society at large. Without the spark of interacting with people on an ongoing and regular basis, there were days I felt like I was literally shriveling up and slowly dying. Not because being alone was boring, I have plenty to do at home, trust me. But without the energy of other people, it increasingly became meaningless. And finally, step five, acceptance. The stage, thankfully, where I am now, and which coincided with the reopening of just a couple of our public spaces back in May. The first thing I did when that happened was to go walking down at the beach. And the simple act of walking six feet away from, and yet still in and among other people was, for me, pretty magical. So what has my takeaway been from this whole process with regard to altering my life to accommodate and accept that social distancing is here for a good long time to come, that I need people in my life, even if from a distance of six feet, six feet. Because without them, my life really becomes very quickly meaningless. And it's as simple and as powerful and as significant as that. Thank you all so much for listening. Good morning, everybody. Well, this was the first time that I had heard my wife's presentation. I would like to just say ditto to everything she said, but I don't think Dave and the worship committee would appreciate that. So thank you all for inviting me to talk with you this morning about my experience of being quarantined, 
practicing social distancing and sheltering in place. And thinking about my reactions to being quarantined at home and socially distant from others, you must first realize that I previously saw myself as a pure introvert who did not feel that I really needed others. I had connections with others around shared activities. For example, my lifelong learning classes through UC Irvine, volunteering opportunities at Ocean Institute, and, and my spiritual services here at Tapestry and my Catholic faith tradition. I enjoyed these connections, but would have probably described the activity as the more critical aspect than the individuals involved. As my wife just indicated, we disembarked from a cruise ship in Florida in early March this year and, and flew home to a Los Angeles and a California that was vastly changed from the one we had left just five weeks earlier. We were faced with where to buy toilet, where and when to go shopping, and what was this whole thing about Zoom all about? In response to COVID, My classes at UCI were canceled and all of my spiritual services at least and while having the opportunity to spend 24 by 7 with my best friend my wife was great I soon discovered that nothing was as I thought it would be I thought I would have more time to finally get to things on my desk and experience more online learning classes but soon realized that I could procrastinate there just as well and nothing ever seemed to quite provide the type of interaction and learning opportunities to me that face-to-face -face classes had. Time to sit and talk with my wife often led to some rather challenging and difficult discussions, fed by the fear, of course, whether we'd be able to even continue our retirement financially. The bravado and self-confidence that I displayed to her was that we would be fine, that we could just ride this out. But I was really left inside with the sense that my world as I knew it was gone and that everything had been turned upside down. I felt lost. And one of the most interesting observations that I had was how I began to crave for some of those people-to-people -people connections that I had previously not paid much attention to. Our oldest daughter, who lives nearby, didn't want to visit us out of fear she could be a carrier and I was in a high-risk population. I couldn't see friends, couldn't connect with family, and even my casual acquaintances were either gone, not available, or keeping themselves at a distance. But then as the weeks began to go by, I began to develop new routines and habits. My introvert was beginning to reassert itself. I would find a way to handle things on my own. But now I was learning about Zoom and using the app to connect to groups and friends who were all struggling in the same place as me. I had long walks with my wife and soon we discovered new areas, paths, and small secret gardens in our neighborhood that we never knew about during the three years that we have lived here. My wife and I began talking about a life with far less travel. And while that was a big change for us from the last few years, we began to realize and enjoy the joys of a simpler, slower lifestyle. In a sense, though, I was discovering in social distancing that there was more depth to my life. I began to realize that I could simply look and be open to new things right around me and old things that were still there, but merely different. And now I am realizing that as we move into the, new, the reopening phase and our new normal, that we have an entirely new set of parameters to explore. My old activities may never come back as they once were or else they may be radically changed. I now frequently have Zoom lunches with friends versus face-to-face -face events. And new opportunities are evolving for us to have outdoor engagements with small groups of friends at parks or at beach with socially acceptable distances. So I'm realizing life is going on, although differently than I thought previously. And while old connections have disappeared, new habits, new routines are growing up to take their place in this new normal, along with new connections. I am learning that in my world, social connectivity is far more important than I ever considered in the past world. Social connections at all levels help produce resiliency in me to respond to life, sharing these experiences with others who share my journey. 
And this resiliency is becoming more critical than I would have ever imagined. Thank you for your time and willingness to listen to my journey and experiences this morning. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to share some thoughts from two perspectives. One uh, from my perspective as a practicing psychotherapist and one as a perspective from, uh, to quote the old comedy troupe Fireside Theater, uh, just another bozo on the bus. Uh, this started for me March 12th was my awakening to this uh, uh, happening. Um, I was preparing to drive the following day to Santa Cruz for a, a much awaited uh, annual songwriters workshop. And um, the night before I received a, an email from the presenters who had already flown in from Vermont saying Santa Cruz had shut down the community center. And uh, if you hadn't left yet, please stay home. Over the next few days, all of the, the alerts went, went out about all the, the lockdowns and my life changed from a very, very busy work life of spending long fulfilled days uh, listening to clients in very engaged, connected conversations to nothing, uh, at least immediate, at least at first, uh, shut down the office and uh, thought some clients would want to continue doing video sessions, but there was an initial sort of jarring grinding of halt uh, to that, that pretty intense connection with, with, uh, with my clients. So we shifted gears. My wife, who's also a therapist, uh, and I both began doing uh, video sessions from home. And my son, David, doing customer service for a credit union, also worked at home. So we each commandeered an office or a bedroom and, um, and set to work. I have to say, the first few days I can still remember were very unnerving, as we really didn't know what we were doing. There was a, and no one knew what was happening with the the outbreak of COVID-19. I remember walking up and down the stairs or passing my wife or son in the hallway. And it's like, uh, what are you doing now? Oh, I'm going to get coffee. Okay, you're done doing this. Is this platform working? There was a sense that we didn't really know what to do with ourselves. Um, my older son, Dylan, moved back in with us for about a month. And he was the one uh, sort of outside worker doing telework, the credit union. And so we helped him absorb that stress of dealing with a public that was... Uh, in varying degrees of compliance with uh, uh, safe practices. Uh, and you can, as you know, there's a wide range of that. So there was the, the coming home, the debriefing, the laundry, the wiping, the disinfecting, and trying to figure out what we're, how we actually are doing all this. Um, I had decided to continue working full time and most of my clients accepted um, using some, um, some video um, format like this. And, and that, was, that was a journey also. Um, at first, there was getting through that sort of the, the peekaboo, or I call it, uh, the eye contact issue, realizing that when I'm gazing, like I'm gazing into my client's eyes, they're, they're only seeing that because they're looking at the camera and vice versa. But, but the, the brain makes that work, and we found out a way, a way to stay completely connected, even if uh, we weren't having to play around with what we're looking at. Um, but more on a relationship level with the clients, it, it, was, it was interesting. Um, and I've had a few hundred hours since the pandemic started to, to notice this happening. Whereas my clients would often come in first and um, in the office and there'd just be a casual conversation. They'd say, how are you doing? And I'm doing fine. Now I find that often a client would just stop and say, how are you doing? And there was a sense that, yes, we're doing this together. This is a, this is a communal experience of having uh, lives be disrupted in various ways. So there was that connection that we, we, we're, we're in this together. Of course, we're in this together with different experiences. A songwriter Steve Seskin wrote a wonderful song called Same Storm, Different Boats, which I think captures that sense of this is something that we're experiencing as a, a community, as a country, and yet we each have our own experiences within that. So I settled into a rhythm with work, um, but because I wasn't as busy as before and not having to commute, I found I had a lot of time on my hands. So I'm at home thinking, um, you know, we're isolated a little bit, of all the things I can do. I'm gonna write that next song, get a recording going, uh, read that book, do that project in the house. And, and I did none of it. Um, I found that, um, uh, and I've always known that I'm not 
I don't do well with solitary projects. I don't really, I don't really enjoy my own company enough to really settle into doing things. I really need to be doing things with people. And so um, it was a struggle at first. I felt some restless anxiety. I started doing walks in the neighborhood and out of my neighborhood and doing some jogging. And at least for the first few weeks, 100% of the time when I passed someone, there was some acknowledgement of the other person back and forth. There was the wave, the nod, the hi, whether you knew people or not, most of the time I didn't know anyone. We'd step out, in, I'd step out into the street, we'd have space, but no one passed without some recognition that everything's different now. That's changed over time, but it was very, very uh, connecting at first. It, no one let you pass without some recognition of that. Um, closer to home, I noticed what was happening with my family. Um, my father, um, my parents both lived in New York in the house I grew up in. My father is 96. My mother is a, uh, a spring chicken at just uh, 95, although they're both about to approach another year older. Um, and they've been there alone for a while. I have a brother who lives nearby and they have aides who come in. And in the midst of being worried about them, I started calling more and I realized I hadn't been calling as much previously. Uh, and it evolved into speaking to at least my father and often my mother um, almost every other day. And I realized that while that was good for both of us, previous to that, I think I had been almost avoiding facing the reality of my father's depression, of his own isolation that began even before the pandemic started. And so it was a, a, a challenge for me to realize I'm, I'm sitting with him through this and not denying that he's going through that, which meant facing whatever guilt or other issues I had about not being there even before the pandemic started. I have three brothers who are spread around the country. And while we love each other, we're not always in touch as much as we thought we would like to be. Well, we talked at the beginning of this, we spent about an hour on a Zoom call talking about our parents and everything else. And, and it was just wonderful. It involved, he evolved into a weekly call uh, for an hour and, and we never miss um, a week of that. And so it's, it's really, it's fostered a connection. And I think without, without having said it, we hope to continue well past this crisis. Um, my daughter's in Texas and we've also started weekly calls, which again, I know she's, she has young children and her husband very busy, but I hope that continues too. Uh, at home, I've gotten closer to my wife and when my son is around, we spend more time together. And I've slowly gotten more comfortable with those parts of myself that really don't want to be alone doing anything solitarily. So I'm bicycling uh, a lot now and meditating and spending some time in the garden and slowly um, uh, tolerating myself more, I might say. But I don't know what's going to happen after this. I'm realizing how important my need for connection and time with other people is. I've started doing some Zoom song circles with people both locally and around the country. But I know that this is going to end. And at that point, I've I have to reevaluate what is this need for people? How does this translate? Is it just going to mean socializing more? Is it going to mean being of service more in places like my admittedly intermittent contact with tapestry? A lot of places where I think I hope to be valuing people and connections more when this is over. So there's a lot to think about, uh, which I look forward to thinking about, and I look forward to all of our futures. Thanks.